Welcome to Speedrunner Reviews. In this series I'll be analysing and reviewing games using the mindset of speedrunning. This video will look at the game from three perspectives. First the casual experience, which is how most people will first play the game. This will look like a condensed standard review. Next we'll discuss the speedrunning experience including all the interesting tech and how well the game holds up as a speed game. Finally we'll look at the tool assisted speedrun, showing what the game looks like when pushed to the theoretical limit. Usually I would separate out the real-time speedrun section from the TAS section, but we'll do it together as one big section this time as the history of the route development jumps back and forth a lot. If you already know the game and want to jump straight to the speedrun part, I've left timestamps in the description. Today we're looking at Zool, which was a platformer released for the Amiga in the early 90s. And we'll be looking at the Master System version today, which I'll explain a bit more in detail later. Just before we get stuck into it, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet and you end up enjoying this video, then a subscription would be very much appreciated as I'm trying to grow the channel and hopefully we'll put out more videos like this regularly. So let's talk a bit about the game itself. Um, it's a platformer game at heart and it was released sort of to compete with Sonic the Hedgehog in the early 90s. And they were pretty blatant about it in its advertisement, such as this magazine article. Now they were pretty successful because I've never really heard of Sonic the Hedgehog, but I know everyone's still playing Zool these days. While we'll get into the gameplay differences later, one thing that it has right off the bat compared to Sonic is the cross-platform compatibility. It was released on pretty much everything that was out at the time, and it means if you wanted to, you probably could play Zool no matter what you had. So the whole premise of the game is to collect 99 items in each level, and it's tracked with the counter on the top right there. Once you get all 99 items, it unlocks the actual exit to the level, and then you can sort of go in it and finish off the level. So we'll see it hit 99, it actually has an arrow pointing you to where the exit is, then all you gotta do is actually go and find that exit. So it's actually kind of one of the first examples of a collectathon because you do have to collect a whole bunch of items and there is usually more than 99 in each level um, but most of the time there's just a little bit more than 99 so you basically need to find everything. The game does have some pretty satisfying physics overall like when you slide down hills and you can also jump and do a spin attack and a shoot attack. There's also this kind of cool wall jump mechanic which you can use to get lots of hidden uh, items and stuff like that. Although the wall jump is a little bit awkward to use because as soon as you press the direction which the wall is, you snap onto the wall immediately again. So it does take some getting used to it, but it is definitely possible to adjust to. Graphics are pretty nice and presentable in this game. Uh, we saw the candy stage first and then there's like this music stage here. I always like looking at this music stage and seeing all the old retro music stuff because it's uh, kind of a product of the time. It's really cool to see. And the third stage is sort of this outside grassy area, it's pretty cool. You also get a boss at the end of each level, but something just doesn't seem quite right about the boss at this stage. I don't know why, it's just kind of weird. One thing that's kind of weird about this game is how long the bosses actually take to kill. I'm going to speed this up a bunch, but you'll see that the boss actually takes a really long time and a lot of hits. I'm not sure if there's a better way to go about killing the bosses, maybe with the jumpy spinny attack, uh, but it does take a heck of a long time to kill these bosses. Eventually you do get through it and kill the bosses though. So it ends up being a pretty deep game. There's lots of like hidden areas with items in it and stuff and it can be a lot of fun to play through. Once you get to know it and get to know where the items are it's pretty satisfying because you can just take a direct path through everything and not have to search around a bunch. But I must say playing it the first time can be a bit frustrating and tedious because finding 100 items per level doesn't sound like much but it really is quite a lot. So it'll take you a while to get through the levels on the first playthrough. The difficulty level isn't too bad, you just have to watch your health, but apart from that, it's not too hard of a game. It's just having the patience to collect all the items. And the physics are pretty good for a game of this era, so it does feel pretty nice to play. Overall, I can recommend this game as a casual experience. I had quite a bit of fun with it. Although if you're going to play it, I'd recommend playing one of the 16-bit versions, like on the Amiga or the Super Nintendo or Genesis or something. The Master System version is fine, but you might as well play the most polished version that was released at the time. So to start off the speedrunning section, I want to talk about this speedrun done by Fozon, and this is a full game speedrun, meaning that he beats every level in the game. As we'll see later, there are some skips that you can do. So this one doesn't use those skips. 
And the reason I want to look at this is just to talk about general movement in the game. So really what Fozon's going to be doing is getting as many of these items as possible with as little backtracking as possible, and that means tight jumps around making sure you grab all the items optimally. Fozon's also grabbed this up arrow item that makes him jump higher, but I think that's just run out about now. So really all this game is, is it's really tight movement, optimizing sort of grabbing the items quickly, and then not slowing down as much as you can. There aren't too many runs of this category though. First one also has to beat all the bosses, and this one's another really weird looking boss. Uh, in the footage that I showed before, I was shooting the boss and that took a long time, but the spin seems to beat the bosses a lot quicker, so that's what Fozon's going to be using here. Apart from that, there's not too much to say about this run apart from just really optimizing movement. Not too many glitches to be seen here. One thing I'll mention is that this is played on the PAL version of the game, and that means it's played at 50 frames per second, because it was only released in PAL regions. Normally on Master System games, you'll have them released in Brazil, and that's 60 frames per second, but this one was not done there. So if you're going to do a speedrun of this game, make sure you're set to a PAL region, either by buying a PAL console or having your emulator set to PAL. One thing that I'll actually mention about playing in the PAL version is that it does actually run slower. So when I say it's 50 frames per second, that's actually slower than 60 frames per second, especially in older games where they didn't compensate for it. So it's actually slower by about 80%. So it can actually make it pretty frustrating if you live in a PAL region and want to get into speedrunning because you have to buy specialized NTSC hardware and normally it won't hook up to, in my case, the Australian power circuit. So I remember when I was buying a Super Nintendo, I had to solder together a cord that was like half a Super Nintendo adapter and half a Master System adapter just to get the NTSC thing working in Australia. Um, but it's worth it to go that little bit faster. Now we'll talk about the Taz a bit. It is slowed down by collecting stuff in the air, but there's a speed trick on the ground. Uh, you can move really fast in this game if you hold the left button and the right button at the same time. So fast, in fact, that the graphics of the level completely break in the Taz. So it makes the Taz for this game really different to RTA, because you couldn't normally hold left and right at the same time on a controller. So for that reason, I actually really like watching the Taz of this game, and it was pretty fun to do. Um, the only thing is it was actually really hard to Taz, because grabbing these items is difficult. Their hitboxes are pretty bad. Um, but what I'm actually showing you right now is not the current Taz of the game, it's quite an old Taz. Uh, let's look at what a current speedrun looks like next. Now we're actually going to watch the current RTA speedrun world record here, and I am going to show you the whole thing because it's all really important. I do apologize if it drags on a bit though. Alright, we're done. And there's credits. So the Gleave Tree you saw in Fozon's run is an example of a credit swap. Uh, now this was originally found in early 2020, and this is what the leaderboards looked like back then. As you can see, there was an absolute flurry of runners that went to the leaderboards and all tied first place, all with a time of 9.88 seconds. And it was a really fun time to be part of the Zool community. Uh, so it was a really easy record to get and pretty much everyone could just tie it. And the run we looked at before was the no credit swap category and that obviously had to be broken off because, uh, well, this glitch can beat the game in 9 seconds. The speedrun was actually popularized by this Easyscape video, How to Beat Zool in 9.88 Seconds. Um, it was gaining a bit of traction before that video came out, but once it came out a whole bunch of people flocked here and all get their 9.88 time. And I want to talk a bit about the history of how this came to be. So the Taz we're actually watching before is a Taz in 3 minutes and 10 seconds that I originally made, and it has the original form of the Credits Warp, which was found by someone called Revenged2. So you have to get all the way to the end of the first stage because you need a bouncy platform, and then we'll have a look at what happens at the start of this stage. It happens pretty early on. So we bounce on this, take damage, hit it, and there's the end of the game. So that was sort of the original form of the warp and it developed a little bit since there. So eventually we found a few more ways to do the credits warp and I eventually managed to pull it back to being done at the very start of the first level. And what we figured out is that the teetering animation on the edge of a ledge is broken. So basically if you hold up, Zool is going to freeze into the teetering animation. So if I hold up now, it'll just freeze there. And then if I let go, it will keep going again. And then if I hold up again, it'll freeze again. So that's pretty good, uh, but where it gets interesting is if you can line up to a very specific teetering animation like this one here, as soon as you press up, the game will just do this, 
and it'll eventually kind of crash and go to the credits. Uh, so there are a few different effects that can happen to this from memory the game can literally just crash uh, but basically that's how the speed run happens you'll get yourself just over onto this ledge here which is the closest one you'll hold up and then you'll win the game and there's a really specific setup for it um, so I made the Taz and basically what the Taz does is it just like starts here and then it holds left and then stops on the ledge and then it presses up to finish the game and it's actually completely replicable in RTA. So that's how everyone tied the record. They weren't just tying each other, they were actually tying the Taz time when they did that. I also want to give a huge shout out to Beatrim, who is a Master System legend. Uh, Beatrim achieved the first ever 9.88 on console, completely matching the Taz. And the fun thing about this is, this makes it the first Master System game that's ever been console verified on a TAS. Not by actually playing the TAS pack, but by having a human replicate the inputs of the TAS. Now with that flurry of activity, everyone got 9.88 matching the TAS, uh, but there's a really specific reason I have this leaderboard filtered here. Eventually, we found a way to get 9.84. Now this is actually slower overall if you use the TAS timing, because basically what you do is you pause and unpause right before the game fades out. If you can do that really quickly, then it fades out slightly quicker. Now given the TAS only times to the last button you press, the TAS is still a 9.88. But if you're doing RTA timing, which times to the fade out, 9.84 is actually the best time you can get. So Fozon and Gogo both managed to achieve that time, which is really impressive. Because it's pretty hard, you have to pause and unpause frame perfectly, which is not easy to do at all. So overall I'd recommend this game as a speed game. It's pretty fun to pick up and if you want to get a Mimi run that's pretty good, you can do it fairly easily. About 40 people are tied for third place here. If you want to really push the game to its limit, you can go for another first place time of a 9.84, but we don't really know of any way to get better than this, so it's pretty capped out and you'd be tying first in that situation. I'd also recommend that uh, you could give Noble Credits Warp a try. This 2631 is probably improvable given Fozon didn't do too many runs. And if you're interested in tazzing, this could also be a fun category to taz with all the left, right, and button press shenanigans and the fast movement you could do in it. So overall, Zool's a pretty enjoyable game, and I had a lot of fun exploring it back in early 2020 and it becoming a meme for a little while. Thanks so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this content, a subscription is always appreciated. I should have more coming out like it soon.